everybody. Welcome to our fourth edition of the Breaking Bread series brought to you by me. I'm Julie Emig. I'm the executive director of the McLean County Museum of History. And today we are going to be learning about the Swedish um, American immigration experience. Uh, before I get more into the details of the program this afternoon, I first want to share the McLean County Museum of History's land acknowledgement statement. The McLean County Museum of History would like to take a moment to acknowledge that the land we call McLean County is the ancestral land of many native groups, beginning with the Paleo Indians 12,000 years ago, and most recently Algonquin speaking groups, including the Kickapoo, who were forced west from this area in the 1830s. As I said, today is uh, the fourth installation of Breaking Bread, and um, I'm delighted to share cafe, <laughs> kanaka bread, and coal. Um, uh, I'm practicing those, those terms, and um, I think I got an approximation of it. And just as a reminder, this is a 10-part program series. It extends through November. Um, we are in partnership with the Museum of History, being welcoming a coalition of the Immigration Project, not in our town, not in our schools, West Bloomington Revitalization Project, the Mennonite Church of Normal, and the First United Methodist. And all of these, these um, partners work together to create a supportive environment for our immigrants in McLean County. We are also partnering with Design Street at Illinois State University, Thank you for your brilliant and colorful graphics and with Heartland Community College. And I know that they are very um, directly engaging their students and staff in learning through the, these programs. As I have the pleasure of continuing to be the MC for each of these sessions, I keep reflecting on that question of push and pull. What pushes people to leave their homes and, and what pulls them into often dramatically different places? What are differences and similarities that come across um, as, we, as we think about each separate experience and then weave them together into a larger tapestry? We are also going to continue exploring these questions within the context of food, a common experience that we all share across cultures. And more specifically, in this afternoon's program, um, we have it being led by our very own Hannah Johnson, who is the Director of Youth and Family Education at the museum. And she will provide a brief history of Swedish Americans in central Illinois. Next, we will have two separate video interviews, one with Gloria McKittrick and the second one with Ed Lundin. And Ed is also joining us today. Um, and we'll stick around afterwards for the question and answer period as well. Our video cooking demo will be of Kanaka Brod, um, <laughs> or hardtack. And finally, we will have that, uh, reserve some time for some questions that we are delighted to get from, from anyone who has an opportunity to participate this afternoon. And as a final reminder, you should utilize that Q&A feature if you want to submit any questions throughout the program. And we are recording this program as always, so it will be made available to all for later viewing. So welcome and thank you for attending. And Hannah, I hand it over to you. All right, Julie, thank you for that introduction. As stated, we are here for Cafe Kanakabrod and Cole, Swedish Americans in central Illinois. So we first want to explore this concept of foster landet, um, or fatherland or uh, more poetically translated, the land that fosters or raises a person. Um, Julie already alluded to these push and pull factors that we explore so often when we're talking about immigrant and migrant groups. Um, in the case of Swedish Americans, um, honestly, it was largely a large population growth in Sweden um, that was that push factor. And the uh, possibility of rich agricultural grounds in the United States was that was that pull factor. Um, religious persecution, other social issues um, are always variables that contribute to a person's uh, motivation to leave their homeland. 
Um, but in this way, it was getting crowded in Sweden. There was room and space in America. Um, and so in the 1840s and 50s, we see this first wave of Swedish immigration, um, but that's pretty much halted by the American Civil War. And so in the census of 1860, we've got about 18,000 Swedish born persons residing in the United States at the time. Um, but post Civil War, by 1870, uh, the census reads 97,332 Swedish born people in the United States. So we've got five times higher uh, population growth in that decade. Um, we move to the 1890 census. We've got 478,000 Swedish born persons um, following the 1880s, which was the decade of highest immigration with a peak in 1887, which brought in about over 40,000 Swedish Americans just in that year. The 1890 census is also significant because it's the first time that we're seeing record of second generation Swedish Americans, um, totaling around 250,000. So by 1920, our second generation folks total um, over 800,000 people. And by this time, Chicago is the second most Swedish city after Stockholm, um, obviously being the capital of Sweden. Um, we do also want to acknowledge that return migration is um, part of the Swedish American story as well. And around a fifth of uh, immigrants to the US did actually return to Sweden at some point in their lifetime. Now, we talked about this early, um, earlier phases of immigration, and uh, we would be remiss if we didn't mention Alfred T. Fagerberg. Um, he is Bloomington's first known Swede, um, coming uh, here around 1864-1865. In 1886, uh, he and his family opened a wallpaper and paint store, which ended up being the largest and oldest Swedish business. Um, it operated until the 1970s, uh, so almost 100 years in business. Um, but in 1912, we had about 1,100 Swedes in Bloomington. So to bring it back locally, we're looking at about 4% of Bloomington's population, which at the time was over 25,000, um, which is significant. But to put it in perspective, um, at the same time, 10% roughly of Bloomington's population were German speakers um, and uh, first or second generation uh, German Americans residing here. So the Swedes were definitely in the mix when we consider our German population, our Irish population and other immigrant communities. So why Bloomington in particular? Um, and before we answer that question, I do want to acknowledge um, or reference uh, the imagery that we see here. Um, if anyone is familiar with the former chocolatier or the stash, um, that was the building um, on the 500 block of Maine where A.T. Uh, Fagerberg's um, business uh, was. So a familiar site for many of us who are downtown fans. So the question, why Bloomington? Um, the answer to that question is coal. So in 1867, the McLean County Coal Company um, opened up. It was the area's largest mine. There were a number um, of other smaller mines in the area, um, but the McLean County Coal Company um, was started by the Stevenson brothers, uh, including Adlai Ewing I. Uh, in August of 1872, uh, the Stevenson brothers brought 30 families from Kiwani and Galva as strike breakers. So we, you know, not to get ahead of ourselves, we mentioned 1860s, we mentioned the American Civil War. Um, the war not only impacted the rate of immigration, um, but it also uh, definitely kind of charged up this need for coal. So we look, we see this kind of first big wave of Swedish immigration in the 1860s. Um, because of this demand for coal regionally um, and kind of that, that halted period um, because of the war. So these you know, corroborating factors are coming together, coalescing. By May of 1899, um, there was an average 700 tons of coal um, uh, 
extricated, produced, right, um, uh, in a day. And about 350 men uh, were employed by the coal company. Um, there was a report by Madame Annette, uh, who was a contributor to the Daily Bulletin, who described the labor force as the cosmopolitan crowd down under. And by that, she was referencing kind of this mix of peoples in the mine, um, looking at African-American workers, English, French, Irish, Italian, Polish, Russian, and of course, this large percentage of Swedish American workers. So we mentioned this August 1872, 30 families from Kwani and Galva being relocated as strike breakers. To comment on that, the Jubilee history of the Swedish Evangelical Lutheran Church published in 1912 states, they were entirely ignorant of the minor strike until they arrived or they would not have come. The McLean County Coal Company had paid their transportation, provided homes and work. They were here and there was nothing to do but remain, suffer the consequences of strike bakers and make the most of it. So, you know, beyond the consequence of being a strike breaker, um, the work of, um, you know, working in a coal mine, right, was extremely dangerous and hazardous on its own. Um, there were a number of strikes then uh, because of it, right? So we're talking about conditions um, like cave-ins and mine fires, other accidents, um, also something known as black damp, which is where carbon dioxide and nitrogen are essentially slowly replacing the oxygen available in the mine. So it wasn't immediately um, poisonous, but could easily lead to suffocation. Um, you can see from here, this picture pictured here is John Johnson um, holding a mule, right? So these are men who are sharing the mine um, with dozens of each other, as well as labor animals. Um, we have record kind of moving ahead in the timeline, but 1904, it was reported that Swedish born Gust Eriksson was a 30 year veteran with the McLean County Coal Company. He was walking down a tunnel with a double cable road. So that's two coal car tracks. And with cars coming at him from opposite directions, he evidently became confused and was crushed to death between the two trains. So Erickson lived in Stevensonville, which we will talk about later, and left behind a wife and four children. So you can imagine um, with these working conditions with um, not often high wages um, and other kind of um, collective consciousness looking at the conditions of other workers throughout the country, um, strikes were, were fairly numerous. Um, and specifically in that 1872 strike is when we saw a kind of a large percentage of new Swedish American blood being brought into Bloomington. So we mentioned Stevensonville. Stevensonville was the company town of the McLean County Coal Company. Um, if we're familiar with George Pullman um, and uh, the company town in Chicago, um, very similar, but on a smaller scale. Stevensonville was located west of the Chicago and Alton Railroad main line, south of Washington Street. It included Magoon and Weldon Streets, as well as West Olive, Stevenson, which is now West Grove, and Stockholm Street. So we can see that direct Swedish connection there. Um, as mentioned prior, the Stevenson brothers, including Adlai, James, and William, along with their partner, Dr. Thomas F. Worrell, um, who was a fellow Democrat, um, and so, uh, you know, created or partnered in um, the Stevensonville project. And so the official name is Stevenson and World's Consolidated Subdivision, um, but that doesn't really roll off the tongue so much. So Stevensonville makes a lot of sense. Um, now, Stevensonville was not originally annexed as part of Bloomington. So they were outside the city limits. Um, there was a large desire to be annexed into Bloomington for a number of reasons, which we'll explore in a minute. But in 1883, 75 property owners petitioned for annexation. And in June 1885, City Council, so Bloomington City Council, voted first against and then eventually for annexation. 
Um, and we mentioned kind of the, the democratic um, leanings of the Stevensons, of course, and Dr. Worrell. Um, there was concern potentially, um, and maybe why the city council first voted against annexation was the idea of Republican versus Democratic loyalties. And so um, it's possible that Republican members of council uh, were fearful that annexing Stevensonville would be a largely Democratic um, population and that that would risk a certain amount of their political um, control in Bloomington. But we'll actually see um, is that there were strong Republican roots um, in the Swedish community in Stevensonville. Um, and so that didn't necessarily play out uh, the same way that they may have feared. But the moral of the story, as it were, is that Stevensonville was annexed into Bloomington in 1885. Now, Stevensonville had a definite character um, in and of itself. Again, these company towns largely are gonna have similar structures because they're all gonna go up at once. Um, there's an efficiency that's built in um, and uh, consistency, right? So Stevensonville uh, totaled 46 acres of three room, one story, quote, working men cottages. Um, miners could place a down payment of $100. And for six years at $10 a month, they were able to pay off their residence. Now by 1881, we saw a total of more than 60 cottages uh, built in the area. Um, but we want to uh, remain cognizant that simply, you know, following annexation did not mean that Stevensonville was afforded the same amenities and utilities that the rest of Bloomington was. And that took time. So it wasn't until 1910 that a water main direct from the city reached Stevensonville. So prior to that, um, the population of Stevensonville was dependent upon wells, outhouses. So we can imagine that 1910 was kind of a banner um, year for those in the Stevensonville neighborhood. We'll note as well um, that most Stevensonville lots are deep. So they could accommodate large gardens. They could accommodate animals, maybe chickens or even a cow um, to help feed uh, the community internally. Another unique aspect of um, the architectural features of these cottages is that many had kitchen and dining areas in basements of the residents. And this struck me as, I don't know if it's irony or if it's just um, slightly sad, but the idea that um, we had these men working days, you know, into night in the mines, underground, in the dark, they leave work, they go home just to enter a basement and eat with their family underground um, in the evening. So uh, there's a certain amount of, I don't know, poetry there, I suppose, um, but a sad one. In 1895, just to further demonstrate um, the large uh, Swedish influence in Stevensonville, the 1895 city directory lists 15 names alone on South Weldon Street, nine of which are Swedish surnames, including Anderson, Peterson, Ekstam, Wallstrom, Johnson, et cetera. And 10 of the 15 just on South Weldon Street um, work for the mine or railroad. So you can note here a couple of contemporary images taken in 2018 by the museum's own Bill Kemp of worker cottages located in the former Stevensonville. And I'll take this moment to um, really thank Bill for so much of the research uh, that I was able to rely on. And Bill offers his very own um, Swedish American program. And so if you're looking to dive in deeper to this topic, um, definitely hit him up. Um, but the imagery, uh, much of it is to thank um, Bill for. Now, a major reason for annexation and in support of it um, was education. And to quote Edgar Lundin Jr., who we'll hear um, from a moment to paraphrase as it were, Education was in the Swedish thinking. It was encouraged, right? Um, and quote, the poor laboring men of Stevensonville, now referred to as by the panograph, um, could not afford their own schoolhouse. So if they were going to actively invest 
um, or at least provide opportunity for education for their younger community members, um, annexation was a big part of that. So um, in 1888, the Stevensonville School opened post-annexation, three years to be exact. It was later renamed the Sarah Raymond School, which hopefully sounds familiar to many, um, located one block from the current uh, Sarah Raymond School. Um, Sarah Raymond was um, named for uh, Sarah Raymond Fitzwilliam, who was um, the superintendent of Bloomington Schools and the first female superintendent. Um, and today, our very own Sarah E. Raymond School of Early Education provides early education for pre-K students in District 87 with developmental needs. Um, so pictured here is an image of the former Stevensonville, later uh, Sarah Raymond School. Now, we can't talk the Swedish community without talking about the Lutheran Church and specifically St. John's. Um, we'll hear more um, from the horse's mouth, as it were, about St. John's in a minute. Um, but to just acknowledge the long history of St. John's Lutheran Church, beginning first with the Swedish Lutheran Church, um, this image here is circa 1912. Um, we then moved to the first English Lutheran church, and that word English is significant, which we'll find out later, um, at uh, 803 West Olive Street. Later um, than that, we the St. John's that most of us are familiar with would be the St. John's at Tawanda and Emerson, um, a architecturally significant and eye-catching building for sure. Um, and anyone who traverses Emerson or Tawanda these days knows that St. John's is currently undergoing um, a large expansion and is really um, kind of reshaping that visual um, architecture and will provide uh, more space for a growing congregation. Um, and PJ Hare uh, Construction is actually um, in charge of that project. And what I'd like to do at this time is share a sneak peek um, that the company put together. So thank you for indulging in that. Um, but the reason the architecture of St. John's is so significant is not only to acknowledge the history um, of that church within the Swedish community, but also um, because of the personal family history of the Lundins. And so at this time, I'm going to share a recorded interview with Edgar Lundin Jr., um, son of Edgar Lundin Sr. And we'll know in a moment why uh, St. John's and other architectural uh, projects here locally are so significant to the Swedish American story here in McLean County. Okay, the Swedish roots are mainly on my father's side of the family. His parents both came to the United States from Sweden separately, one at age 12, one at age 25. My grandmother was called to 
take care of a cousin's children after his wife had died. And uh, he wrote to Sweden and said, send, uh, send Tilly over to take care of my kids, which she did. But when he remarried, the second wife and Tilly, I understand, clashed. And so Tilly found employment uh, in the home of Judge and Mrs. John Milton Scott. The Scott home is where the city of Bloomington City Hall is today. Going back to my grandmother, she was probably very much of the old country. Her best English slogan was, uh, be quiet in church, and uh, she preferred Swedish. Anytime she could visit with someone, she would lighten up and talk and sw speak Swedish and talk to her friends, and uh, she was a little hesitant to be an English speaker. Like many of the ethnic groups, the Swedes were pretty tightly knit because of their language, and, and, and they were hated uh, when they arrived in Bloomington because they did not know they were strike breakers. Uh, at the coal mine. One of the things that we wouldn't think about necessarily today, but as a coal miner, in the winter, it was dark when you went down in the mine. And it was dark when you came up from the mine. So the only day of the week that you saw sunlight was on Sunday. I'd hate to try that sometime. I think the weeks would get awfully long, especially at three fifty or four dollars a day. And the, the church dues at that time were $4 a year for a man, an adult man, and $2 for an adult woman. So, so for $6 a year, you were a member of the Swedish Lutheran Church. I can remember when the church first started the English services in 1921. By 1923, they were all English. But I can remember Axel Olsen speaking to the youngsters who were lobbying for more English in the church, that if Swedish was okay with Jesus, it ought to be okay for you. My grandfather uh, came to the United States with a completed apprenticeship in cabin making and uh, woodworking and so forth. Uh, he worked at the uh, Morat's mill. In those days, your doors and windows and things were uh, made in the mill, not on the job. And uh, to have a mill locally, it was uh, very convenient. Uh, he would walk to work each day from uh, 905 West Olive Street, which was their home that he built for his bride and uh, raised three children there, one of being my father, the middle child. My father, went through the Bloomington school system. He was stopped in 1918 by the Spanish flu for a while and then uh, a few months in the army and then he returned the following fall to uh, the University of Illinois where he graduated in architecture in 1923. He came back to Bloomington and joined the firm of A.L. Pillsbury in the People's Bank Building. Unfortunately, Mr. Pillsbury was killed in an auto accident coming back from a football game in Champaign. This was very sudden, of course, and uh, they discovered that uh, my father, who had recently graduated two years before, had been registered by the state of Illinois and licensed to practice architecture, which none of the others had, uh, as they had been practicing under Mr. Pillsbury's license. So they reorganized the firm, which they had to do, and the attorney set it up for my father's name to be first because he was the one licensed. And that didn't suit the senior people very much, and I can understand why. So it was shortly changed to the name of the, the senior people, followed by E.E. E. Lundin, registered architect. And that's, that's took care of it, but it still gave them back their seniority. He and Mr. Rosen left that, the associates uh, in, I believe, 1937. Yeah. And they moved to the Corn Belt Bank building. There was a division of the work that was in process. 
and uh, agreements to assist back and forth between the two offices as needed. Anyway, uh, following that, he uh, taught uh, at Bloomington High School in uh, 1943 and maybe part of 44, uh, drafting and so forth, and, and also the electrical. And as I remember, they were in the Army uh, in the trade school downtown here where they were training and some would come up and take classes. Well, uh, after the, and during that time, there was no building. There were a few back porches that went on, but there were, uh, lumber wasn't available. Uh, even nails were scarce. Paper clips were scarce. But he would go to the school boards and they would keep up to their, as their requirements were. So there were a lot of uh, plans that were made and partially approved for when they could build. And the schools got some priorities probably before any personal housing. In Bloomington, it was, it's sort of funny, you go out on East Emerson and the Unitarian Church is there and next to it is St. John's Lutheran Church, which, which they did. And then across the street, further down is the Jewish Temple. And, uh, so, and then they also did the Episcopal Church on, on East Oakland Avenue and Wesley Methodist downtown with the tall tower. He, he was pro bono to what he, to the extent that he could, but he couldn't do it on the ter firm's time when they would have to charge for it. There was a dentist who was a member of the church who told Dad to be sure to build a steeple big enough for uh, a carillon, that he wanted to contribute a carillon to bills to the church. Well, that was until October 29th, I think it was, 1929 and he called and had to renege on his promise. And so there is a single bell up in that large belfry on the church and it's still there. The Majestic Theater was the Vaudeville Theater and uh, during the 20s it was very active. Well, Vaudeville days were over so they finally closed it and it was eventually demolished. Anyway, uh, when they wanted to talk about an organ. It was in probably about 1939 for our church on Olive and Allen. The pastor Westberg, who was here, he later became famous for holistic medicine, but he said it would be so nice to have a pipe organ in the church. Julius Nordeen, uh, again a relative and a later councilman on the city council, and his brother Fritz Nordeen was here and and uh, Fritz said, uh, I bet you there's an old organ in the Majestic and the Castle Theater. And uh, they checked and yeah, there were. So they said, let's, let's uh, wonder if we could get permission to get in and inspect those and see if they could be used in the church, which they did. And, and uh, Fred Hunt, Mildred Lundeen's husband, who was an organ builder, among other things, checked them out and he said the Barton organ in the Majestic uh, could be used. And so they negotiated with Balbin and Katz Theater Company in Chicago to, uh, to take the organ out of there. And, uh, and the church members hit the place like ants on an anthill and they started carrying pipes. Well, where do we put them? What are, where is this? Uh, the only thing they didn't really bring was the elevator that lifted the organ out of the out of the uh, basement area and would bring it up to the into the organ into the orchestra pit so everybody could see uh, the organ. I worked all summer cleaning the electromagnets under every every pipe section. I even wore out the top of my overhauls because I would clean them on there and went through. But by the end of the summer. Uh, the organ was working and was dedicated in September of 41. Then uh, Uncle Fred, who had completed this installation, his middle name was Barton, and the, and the organ was a Barton organ. And I asked him, are you related? Oh, no. That's all I said. Axel Olson lived on the farm, and he was from Sweden. One day he was chopping wood, and a piece took out his eye. He was the man who would butcher a hog and they'd make potato score, potatoes and meat and put it in the casings of the, of the hog. And then he would bring it to the church and there'd be a big church supper. The church suppers were to die for. 
My father broke a tooth, I remember, one night. He was late in getting there. And then they turned the lights down, and they had served a half grapefruit with a, a little candle in it. But we also had a candle holder made out of plaster of Paris that, that it was in. Well, by the time he got there, the candle had burned down and it was out. And the tables were pretty dark. And all of a sudden, he had bitten on this. And, and he, that I, isn't it funny how you remember some of those stories? Another story he used to would tell is that he was confirmed at age 13. That would have been in about 1911. And uh, he twisted the buttons. He was so nervous, he had to be confirmed in English and Swedish because the Swedes had to ask him questions. And, so, and he was so nervous that he twisted the button off of his new coat that his mother had made for him. Education was a very strong part of the Swedish thinking, and they just uh, uh, encouraged that uh, as much as possible. In 1954, the, the church had been without a pastor um, and uh, for several years. And uh, the congregation, I'm guessing, was probably about 350 people plus kids. And uh, this seminarian arrived after two or three had been there to preach. And uh, everyone really liked him. And uh, they called him, called him to come to the church when he graduated, which he did. Now, everyone assumed he was a good Swede because he just sounded like a Swede. He was everything about him, and, and but no one uh, ever asked or, or, or questioned. Well, it was two years before he had this, had the, uh, shall we say, the fortitude to say, now, I've never said anything to this congregation, but my background is Norwegian. <laughs> and I remember everyone applauded, so that was fine. But that was Pastor Skillrud, who was here for 25 years and then uh, went to uh, Atlanta, Georgia, and was bishop of the southeastern United States. And then we had several meetings with the Pope. We were talking about my Norwegian wife. We've gotten along now for 68 years very nicely. We sometimes argue whether, as they said, what's dumber than a dumb Swede, a smart Norwegian. We actually visited Denmark and Sweden. And I think, uh, all in all, any difference that were, there was in Europe between the Swedes and the Norwegians, I know the countries changed geographically a little bit, uh, had disappeared. And the only, the only uh, uh, thing, you, the only place we found any, and, and it wasn't anger, but any, any uh, differences, is in, in those who came over from the old country and the descendants of that, well, we gotta, we have to keep that tradition going of the Swedes and the Norwegians. Excellent. Um, so hopefully we feel a little bit more intimately knowledgeable um, of some of those firsthand Swedish American experiences. Um, what I wanna transition to at this time is something that maybe wasn't appropriately articulated um, earlier in the presentation is, again, the, the west side location of Stevensonville. Um, and this is in conjunction with other west side neighborhoods, largely immigrant and migrant neighborhoods, um, like 40 Acres um, and Sunnyside and South Hill. And um, if you will indulge me, I would actually uh, plan to read in full um, a, a photo essay that was published in 1950, so the centennial of Bloomington, in the panograph, um, written by Wilma Tolley. Um, and the reason why I think it's so significant uh, to read through this text is part of the goal of this program series is really to um, draw the connection between past lived experience um, and contemporary lived experience, particularly within our migrant and immigrant groups um, but largely, you know, as a community. And the idea that in 1950, we were writing about the East-West divide in Bloomington and acknowledging its long history at that point, um, I think is, uh, is worth reflection. So um, uh, to read Wilma Tolley's uh, words, 
Like most old towns, Bloomington has reached its 100th year this year with a complex about east west side with a country club and the cabbage patch. Now in Bloomington, it's always been known as the east side and the west side. Main Street running north and south splits the town nearly in half. Traditionally, everybody living east of Maine was an east sider and represented the moneyed class and everybody living west of Main Street was a west sider and represented the working class. And the popular opinion 50 years ago was that never the twain would meet on equal footing. When the town divided is anybody's guess, but it dates back to at least Bloomington's boom days as a railroad town when call boys were hired to summon railroad workers to the job and Main Street came to be the boundary beyond which call boys were not obliged to travel. Hence, railroad men, then the biggest working class in town, all dwelt west of Main Street and perhaps gave rise to the sentiment that it's the working man's end of town. Now that Bloomington is 100 years old, it was undertaken to learn how the situation on the west side as the more colorful of the two sections is today. It appears the imminence of a shooting war has died down to an attitude of Cold War suspicion still found on the west side where all research for this article was confined. It was given on good authority that a West Side girl can be squired home by an East Side boy now without being fearfully certain that a poacher wouldn't have his nose bloodied or worse within minutes after her front door closes. It appears that whereas persons still talk glibly about living on South Hill or Stevensonville or in the 40 acres, the boundaries of these near famous old West Side neighborhoods are considerably smudged now. So many different opinions on just where the landmarks are that the issue had to be carried to the Bloomington police station for a decision. Here's what the policeman said. Anybody living from Irving School south to Highland Park Golf Course is a South Hiller. The area was a real hill once. Stevensonville is the area where Swedes settled and specifically the stomping ground of A.G. Erickson, now 86, who rose to be a city leader. The sprawling 40 acres is the settlement of foreign born, the Irish, Hungarians, and Germans who built solid houses in big yards and worked for the railroad. Sunnyside, as ill-named as possible, considering the usual sense of such a cheerful name, is a patch of poor housing huddled against the magnificent backdrop of the new Ralston Purina plant completed this year. It appears that although the West Side was once a tough neighborhood, the issue is debatable today. Proponents of the claim frequently point to the Bloomington police force as living proof. 26 of the 35 local policemen live on the West Side, most of them native born sons. It appears that the West Side is still the working man section as evidenced by the modest homes but it is not as uniformly true now. There's Sunnyside where a family of nine was found living in a reconditioned boxcar and a one room shack. The mother of the house was asked if the family was crowded. She answered no. But there is also a man on the west side, South Hill area, who has built a private swimming pool in his backyard for his daughter. It appeared from all hands finally that no story on the west side could be expected to carry any weight without the okay of A.G. Erickson, king of the Swedes. Mr. Erickson lives in a white frame house across the street from the Erickson store at 1311 West Olive Street, operated now by his son, Edward. Mr. Erickson is nearly stone deaf, but he likes visitors to come and shout with him. Quote, Stevensonville is the prettiest part of town, he declared loyally. I wouldn't live anywhere else. Nearly everybody's got fruit trees and room for a garden. He is probably the most famous alderman of all time from the quote, bloody seventh ward and has passed the honor down to his grandson, Robert, alderman now. He was mayor of Bloomington after the death of Mayor James Neville in 1906, served on the McCain County Board of Supervisors, was a city commissioner the eight years Bloomington had the commission form of government. He served on the Board of Education 12 years and is proud that Sheridan, Raymond, and Lincoln schools were built in his time, all three on the west side. 
and he's been Republican precinct man for 45 years. All right. So the words of Wilma Tolley dating back to 1950, we see here the map um, that designates our various West Side communities. Uh, mentioned that this was a photo essay, right? So um, pictured here is a slag pile, now grass grown, all that remains of the Bloomington coal mine that it employed from 100 to 300 men. Um, this view was taken from Livingston Street. And then the aforementioned A.G. Erickson, quote, King of the Swedes, a West Side leader for 50 years. Um, other pictures of Sunnyside and South Hill were included in the essay as well. So this was published May 21st, 1950. May 23rd, 1950, there was a response, um, a quite visceral one from the West Side community, uh, particularly those residing in Sunnyside, um, who took issue with um, Wilma Tolley's uh, assessment of the area. So pictured here is the photograph that was included in the photo essay of Sunnyside. It says Sunnyside is the cabbage patch area of makeshift houses and dirty children who play in rubbish strewn backyards. Looming in the background is the Ralston Purina plant. So I won't read the replies in full, but a letter to the editor uh, does state East Side, West Side, Country Club, Cabbage Patch. I, for one, happen to be of the latter. As you imply, unfortunate. Trusting soul that I am, I'll confess I had knowledge of the photographer being in the neighborhood at the time, but I mistakenly gave them credit for a little decency in the matter. The person writing thought that the photographer was there to potentially take photographs of a housing um, dispute or conversation that was occurring um, in council at that time. But they explained to the panograph in this letter to the editor, that like any other areas, we have our good and our bad points. We have reason to be proud of any number of our homes and don't need to be ashamed of them. They are modest, of course, but owned in most cases by families who live there. They are mostly wage earners and spend their money to support the town. Dirty children, I don't like your reference. Our children are like any other children. They have dirty faces at play sometimes perhaps, but not dirt that can't wash away. Anyhow, as they grow up, they take their place in the world without apology. Now, this was kind of a biting um, uh, letter um, in response to the photo essay. And the panograph replied that the people of the West Side still have the elements of independence. We attempted to show that in a word and picture report. We thought we were depicting a typical American community of self-reliant people who grow fruit trees for shade and food, make gardens and generally look after themselves. We depicted some of the good and some of the bad conditions of the area with no intent to damage anyone and with every intent to give accurate picture. Um, and so again, we bring this up because it's a continued conversation in our community, this West East side divide. Um, and even in 1950, the panograph is quoted as saying, it is unfortunate too, because the panograph has been trying over the years to help erase that imaginary dividing line between East Side and West Side. It is imaginary. There are about as many areas of slum housing on the East Side as there are on the West Side. There are working people all over town. They are not confined to any area. So I would challenge ourselves to consider um, the existing East-West divide and maybe how it has changed since the 1950s, how um, it may still be similar, and uh, maybe some of those contributing factors to this perception uh, within our community. Next, we're going to hear um, from Gloria McKittrick, the great-granddaughter of the aforementioned King of the Swedes, A.G. Erickson, and a little bit more about the Erickson's um, impact on Stevensonville and the larger Bloomington Normal community. Well, A.G. Erickson was my great grandfather on my father's side, and he is from Sweden. 
he came over here as a young boy when he was seven years old in, oh, let's see, 1868 or 69. He and his mother and father and uh, his older sister moved to Kiwani. And uh, there are a lot of Swedes in the Kiwani Galesburg area. And um, they actually got to Bloomington because the Stevensons were having a strike in the coal mines here in Bloomington, and they went up to Kiwani and recruited. Um, did you see that cat? Anyway, um, so they were recruited to come and work in the coal mines, and that's how the Ericsons got to Bloomington. My grandfather was a, a very young boy at that time. I was still in school, but at age 13, he left school to go work in the mines, which back in the late 1800s was a very common thing to do. And um, this thing about it is that when he grew up and become a young, became a young man, he then became the um, president of the local miners union, which I think is very <laughs> kind of a uh, touche. <laughs> well, when A.G. Um, was a young man, he left the coal mines after a period of time. He was a clerk for a grocery um, wholesaler in Bloomington. He also was a postal worker. And in 1885, his younger brother, Charles, had uh, purchased a grocery store on West Olive Street at 1316 West Olive. And it was the Stevenson grocery store. And it was the Stevens who they named Stevensonville, where a lot of Swedes and other ethnic groups, the Irish, settled there, at coal miners especially. And uh, that became the Erickson grocery store. Charles died very suddenly about six months after purchasing this store. And so my great-grandfather and his father, who at that time, I think, was uh, retiring from the coal mines, took over the store. And then um, in the early 1900s, they built uh, across the street a nice new brick building. And that's where the Erickson grocery store then was for all of those years. And it still stands today. And today, there's a wonderful program um, Dreams are possible that is being run by Mary Campbell. It's a program to help underemployed or uh, unemployed women find better jobs, better paying jobs. So it's kind of a training program to help them move up the ladder, so to speak. And I'm very proud that uh, they're using that space for that. The Erickson grocery store was very, very important to West Siders. And as we all know, many years ago, before the advent of great big, huge grocery stores, neighborhood grocery stores were the lifeline for people. Um, we, we didn't have what we call now food deserts. It wasn't heard of back then because there was generally, a, especially in the city of Bloomington, there was a grocery store on just about every block or every other block. So little neighborhood grocery stores were very, very important. And I remember as a small child, about five years old, going into the store with my father, the old wooden floorboards on the floor, and there weren't very many shelves. A lot of the shelves were on the walls. There were a few center aisles, but a great big, a barrel that had dried loot fisk in it, dried, dried cot big long pieces of dried cod and people would soak that in to get out the lye and they would soak it in water for a couple of days to get all that out soften it up then they would bake it or do whatever they did with it and um, the way the Ericsson's always fixed it was they would bake it and make a wonderful white sauce a bechamel or white sauce and I remember Lutfis as a small kid. You know, kids can be pretty picky with foods. I loved it. 
and you hear people say, oh, it's the most awful stuff. Well, your people didn't know how to fix it. <laughs> and I have to bring up Swedish coffee. I just made some the other day. It's, an, it's coffee made with egg, which sounds weird. It's absolutely delicious. It was the only coffee we ever had in our house. And we always had a pot on the stove. Um, and it would get stronger and longer as the day went on. But I mean, I started drinking coffee when I was like in sixth grade. And uh, so I've been drinking it ever since. One of the things that we served with Swedish coffee, and we did this all year, was rusks, R-U-S-K, which is Swedish. Uh, it's a bread, a fine bread, and it's baked in the oven, and it's in a real slow oven allowed to dry. And uh, then they would sometimes put cinnamon and sugar on, on it when it was done. It was so good. But then later, my elder aunts uh, would use old um, hot dog buns because they were the perfect size. They would cut them in half and they would butter them all over, smear those with cinnamon and sugar, put them in the oven and bake them real slow until they were hard. And oh, they were the most delicious things dipping in your <laughs> Swedish coffee. <laughs> so I was raised Catholic, but my father was Lutheran and uh, we lived right near the Erickson family. They were very much involved with St. John's Lutheran Church and the Erickson family were some of the founding members of St. John's when it started way back whenever. And I remember, um, on Christmas Eve, many times St. John's would have a midnight service or a late service. Um, and we would go over there for Christmas Eve dinner and always about 10 or 11 at night, half of them would leave to go to church. <laughs> so that was kind of a sign, well, dinner's over. <laughs> I really don't remember my great aunts and uncles speaking any Swedish language, it, you know, they're, they were speaking English. I, I think they assimilated fairly quickly into the American culture, as did many immigrant families that came over here, tried to, you know, become accustomed to American way of life. It made it easier for them. And I know from reading interviews uh, that they did of my great grandfather that he was very involved in the community and it was always his opinion that he wanted to do things to help the people to help his community well, ag was not only the mayor he was uh, uh he filled out the term of mayor neville who died in office he was an alderman at that time and he was appointed to fill out his term and i think it was maybe a year and a half that he finished that term, and then ran for uh, office and won. And he served another term as mayor. And he also then later served before and after on many boards and commissions. And AG's name is on, if you would go to some of the old schools, grade schools especially, that were built during that period of time. His name is on the cornerstones. You can also see his name on the uh, fabulous uh, World War I soldiers monument at Miller Park. Then later in life, my grandfather uh, followed in his footsteps and ran for city council. Unfortunately, he did not win. Uh, but then his two sons, my father ran and unfortunately did not win, but his younger brother ran and he did win. And he served, uh, I don't know, I think at least one term as a city councilman. Um, then one of AG's other sons uh, also worked for the state of Illinois. So it, they've kind of been involved in politics and serving the community for a long time. I worked for the Bloomington Housing Authority for 25 years the last 10 as an executive director and uh, was involved. I came on with the housing authority just as the Woodhill Towers and the Woodhill family units were being opened in 1971. 
and stayed until 1996. And happy that I was able to serve my community that way by helping those who needed housing. And uh, let me tell you, people have the wrong idea about people living in housing. They just want a better life. And many of them are very hardworking people. And I saw during my years there, many of them work and work hard and move on and move out and buy their own homes, which was so rewarding because you felt like you were really helping someone to live the American dream. We lived in what once was my great uncle's house. Across the street was the Erickson Grocery. A block down the street, my grandparents lived. A block away from that was cousins and uncles. And, you know, just so there were like three or four blocks there along Olive Street. And there were at least a half a dozen Ericsons living. <laughs> I have to show here uh, for you. A Swedish dollar horse. I I have several of these, and the these uh, these sit out all year. But I also have a lot of other things that I put out at Christmas time that I have purchased at Bishop Hill, which is a Swedish enclave up north of Galesburg, and um, they have a tremendous Christmas celebration starting right around Thanksgiving every year and their shops sell all kinds of things. It's really fun to go up there and take in all that Swedish tradition. And one thing I want to tell you, um, A.G. Erickson made quite an impression on back there in Sweden. And according to my cousin Dave, his name is still remembered by older Erickson family members today. He was uh, quite the celebrity uh, back in the 20s, 1920s. Uh, I remember he traveled over there and he was treated like a king and uh, very well thought of by everybody. You know, it was really wonderful for them to think a family member went to America and became such a prominent person. So a lot of pride, a lot of pride. And the name still lives on. So that makes me happy. All right. So uh, to uh, finish up with Stevensonville and kind of put the button on this exploration of that neighborhood within our larger community, here is a poem that was actually included in volume one of Hometown in the Corn Belt, which was compiled in and published in 1950 by Clara Louise Kessler. So those of you who are not familiar um, with this compilation, there are only two existing hard copies in the world. Um, one at the McLean County Museum of History, one at our friends Bloomington Public Library. Uh, but this collection is now available online through digital archives. So you can look up this poem later um, on your own time. But it reads Stevensonville. Natives of Sweden built this settlement, the first comers who toiled in shop or mine, their imbued home loving traits evident, in cottages adorned with flower and vine, a fair complexioned blonde and sturdy folk, in Selma Lagerlof's pages we meet, Delacaria's dialect some of them spoke, and others had trodden on Stockholm Street. Retaining for homeland affection dear, the ocean crossed, a new life was begun. Industrious and frugal, they prospered here. Their staunch spokesman was Alec Erickson. Many have now passed on, some moved elsewhere, but still the names predominate out there by James Hart. So we will conclude today's program um, by bringing it back to the theme of breaking bread um, with a small cooking demonstration. And then we'll be able to open it up um, for questions with the famed Ed Lundin Jr.
to conclude with a note. Um, I want you to picture those rounds of Kanaka Broad um, hanging from the rafters. Um, oftentimes Kanaka Broad was uh, baked seasonally. Um, so once in the spring and once in the fall. Um, so you'd bake up a whole bunch and it would dry um, through the months and oftentimes was kind of strung up in the rafters so you could grab one down um, when you needed it to pair with your other foods. Um, so sustenance um, in its simplest and often most delicious form. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, and just just so you know, Ed, the comments have, have been very enthusiastically appreciative of your storytelling, master storyteller, um, a comment that Gloria is a stitch, wonderful um, stories and history. And Hannah, a question that came up earlier um, that was inspired by your reflection about those basement kitchens. Um, Sarah Lindbergh wonders if anybody had, has ever studied if there were incidences of radon exposure or um, you know, that translated into lung cancer rates among the miners in Stevensonville. Yeah, I'd say that's an um, excellent question. I would presume that the miners were more concerned about the lung ailments um, that they may have uh, manifested because of their work in the mines, but I'm sure um, that there could have been other uh, variables like radon exposure and such that was happening at home too. So not ideal conditions. I mean, there is something uh, convenient about dirty men entering directly into the basement. Um, but from a quality of life perspective, I would say they probably would have preferred otherwise. Hmm. Yeah, Mike Matika writes, black lung, lung from the mines was a quicker killer than radon. Yeah. A lot more effusive comments, beautifully done, incredibly informative. Um, I was wondering too about, I guess two things, this notion of self-reliance, like, right? That there's this American ideal that we're all very self-reliant and, um, and this, the, the cultural almost ease of adaptation that it seemed the early Swedish settlers experienced, um, I wonder, you know, if, if either one of you could speak to that, is, is there something about the Swedish immigrant experience that is unique or, um, you know, or is it just that some cultural experiences um, tend to move in this direction in a more comfortable way, for lack of a better word? <laughs> Ed, do you have any thoughts on that? I uh, have been sort of uh, enthralled lis listening to all this information that you put together and how impressed I am that you condensed our interview to a very more interesting than, than the original. Anyway, uh, I, as far as the miners were concerned, uh, uh, the fact of, of being underground and in, in, in conditions, we, there was no workman's compensation at that time. If you were injured, uh, that was it. Your job is over. And uh, it uh, would rest then upon 
friends and neighbors and churches to to carry that family on. Uh, and uh, I, I just wanted to add that. Mm -hmm. And your other, the last question you were talking about. In terms of, um, were there any uh, factors that maybe allowed the Swedish immigrant community to more quickly assimilate, right? Or um, be embraced within the local community and the existing culture? Well, the, there were, uh, they quickly uh, moved from the coal mines if they could. Mm -hmm. And uh, storekeepers, uh, downtown Bloomington, uh, there were uh, uh, people who were handling the uh, rails, uh, local rail system. Uh, the, there seemed to be a Swede in most every, in the police department. Uh, I know the, uh, uh, the group spread out. They were not totally confined to the, uh, to the coal mine, but that was certainly a, a negative first start to become to be hated by all the coal miners that uh, were on strike. But uh, I think the, the language barrier uh, was uh, a, definitely a, a, a matter for, particularly for homebound family members. I think the men picked up the English maybe a little sooner. At least I was exposed to more uh, of, the, of the male members of our church than I was uh, by the ladies who seemed to stay in the kitchen and 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 talk uh, talk in the Swedish language uh, very comfortably, and uh, uh, that's about all I can remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll say too. I actually I asked Gloria that question because it was a similar thought of mine. Right, um, mm -hmm. we know the local story of um, our Irish Americans, and you know the. Um, the prejudice that German Americans faced, um, particularly during uh, certain war efforts, right? Um, but uh, so she equally didn't have an exact answer, um, but I do think um, one of the, the shared understandings is um, that embrace of the English language um, and how readily um, that happened or potentially more quickly within the Swedish community than otherwise. Um, and I think too, it can't go, you know, unsaid that the complexion and the features of, you know, stereotypical Swedish stock. I am not representative of the blue-eyed, fair-skinned, um, blonde Swedes, um, but compared to the the physically distinguishing features of other communities, right? Um, I think that's, uh, yeah, potentially contributes to that more easy assimilation. Um, and yeah, obviously took kind of local politics um, by storm, depending on where you were um, within the ward system, um, super prevalent um, at that level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, let's see, in the story of Second Presbyterian Church's ownership and operation of the Stevensonville Mission School from 1894 to 1897, when the school was discontinued. So is that story from that time? Um, that is an excellent question that I, I cannot, yeah, um, lend expertise to. So I'm not personally familiar um, with the relationship between 2PC and the Stevensonville mission school, but that's now officially on my list to look up. Right, and, and it may be answered in the chat because I've noted that sometimes <laughs> people start to have a conversation, which is excellent. Uh, what are the Swedish food ways besides Swedish meatballs that are integrated um, into contemporary American cuisine? Ed, do you have comments on that? Pickled herring is certainly one of them. Mm -hmm. Do we, do we find that to be mainstream these days? <laughs> During the holidays. Uh, it's exactly right. Sometimes hard to find it. 
Um, I will say, so I am of a Swedish background, um, but have been a vegetarian since the age of 12 and uh, pickled herring is like number one on my list. There is no facsimile and it is probably the thing that I miss the most, um, but uh, we'd probably be remiss if we didn't acknowledge, uh, you know, Ikea's definite mainstream um, and kind of contemporization of, of Swedish cuisine. So I think most Americans are probably, that's their entry point, right? Um, with Swedish cultures, Ikea for better or for worse. Um, but, uh, but yeah, meatballs are definitely high on the list. Uh, but I, I do miss the pickled herring though. I know it's probably not everybody's favorite. <laughs> I have one other comment on the on the herring. I have heard now this is hearsay, but from Swedes that in the old country that uh, they would can herring, mm -hmm. and uh, in the winter when it was a choice between the herring that had not sur survived too well the canning process versus pine cones the the rotten herring was preferred. Mm. That's very hard to think about, but I, I can see in a in a situation where the the food did not last all the, for the entire winter season that uh, there are other things. And there's one more thing I would like to say about my grandfather Alfred. <clears throat> there were four brothers, he being one of them, that came from uh, Sweden. And he had completed his uh, apprenticeship in, in uh, furniture making, inlaid and so forth. And he was 25. But the four brothers decided that there were so many Carlsons in Sweden and so many of the Johnsons and so forth, but Carlsons, and they were Carlsons. So they decided that they would change their family name before they came to America and they changed their name to Lundin. Hmm. That is one of the reasons when we run into a Lundin in another situation, say in Chicago or somewhere, mm -hmm. uh, that, it, that they have not uh, been relatives in any way, shape or form because we were, the family was formerly, formerly uh, Carlson. But it, the th three of the brothers, uh, moved on to Paxton, Illinois, uh, the Augustana College was in Paxton at that time in the 1800s and so the 1880s. So that's a uh, uh, just another thing that may have happened to, to more than one family, uh, either uh, changing a name or uh, handling their uh, their assimilation in a different way. Well, I'm glad that you brought that up, um, Ed, because uh, you know the naming tradition within Scandinavian countries, specifically Sweden, um, is you know adding son or daughter right at the end of a name, and so there was kind of this proliferation of folks who had the same name and changing that name to differentiate um, oneself from the larger Swedish community. Um, there's a local story of a man named Carl Hainer, who um, had a name prior that ended in son, and there were too many of those around. And so to differentiate uh, himself, um, he named himself kind of an Americanized version of the location in Sweden from which he hailed. Um, and that allowed him to kind of take that one step outside of um, kind of that cultural, you know, expectation. Um, and then the one other thing I want to add about food traditions is the open-faced sandwich is a very Scandinavian thing. And so if you eat an open-faced sandwich, um, that's a definite extension of that Scandinavian tradition. I'm going to take a moment to share um, a panelist's comment about her own family's experience. This is, um, again, Sarah Lindbergh. Uh, thank you for this interesting program um, and sorry to bring a more dark perspective to this discussion. I am first generation Swedish with parents who emigrated to Chicago in the 1950s. They immediately encountered racism in Chicago 
as it affected working people in the Chicago trades. It is to be admitted that racism is likely to have affected the experiences of African Americans and other BIPOC in Bloomington. It is easier for whites too, at least before they begin to speak, to fit into existing white culture. This reality was one that saddened my parents greatly as they came to understand their new home. There were advantages to being white that eased Swedish experience in the 1950s and beyond. And I feel called to bring this reality forward. And that, for me, that really connects back to um, thinking about that east-west side distinction as well, like what it means to come from a particular cultural background related to your work, right, and how you're perceived and therefore treated. Um, Greg Coos is wondering, uh, many girls worked as servants in rich people's houses. Do you have any stories of that? Um, Ed, do you want to maybe revisit uh, the Scott connection? Yeah, I'd be glad to. Um, my uh, grandmother, uh, as I mentioned before, was called to the United States to take care of the children of a, uh, a cousin whose wife had died. And uh, subsequent to her, his remarriage, she needed to find other employment because they, she didn't get along with the new wife. And so at, she was employed in the household of, uh, we have a train or a fire engine going by. Uh, she was employed in the household of, of Judge Scott. And <clears throat> uh, she said that every evening he would come through and lock every door in the house, room doors, the outside doors, and so forth. Uh, he had sent so many uh, people to prison that he was afraid that some night a person may uh, be angry enough with him that he would, they would try to get into the house. But what worried my grandmother more than anything else was the fact that what would we do if this house caught on fire? And uh, that uh, it was a two story home. I remember the house uh, before it was torn down. It was got pretty ramshackled as I remember uh, sort of uh, absent of paint and very, very weathered. Uh, but uh, he certainly left a uh, wonderful uh, amount of uh, treasure to the to the city. Uh, he had a trust prepared, as we all know, and uh, at his uh, the death of the last heir of this trust, the land was to be sold and given to the girls' <coughs> uh, home that uh, was an industrial home, which didn't exist by the time that occurred. So the, the funds were distributed to the uh, Bloomington School and the Scott Health uh, section, uh, section right now is a, is a survivor of that money. And then of course the uh, children's uh, home on State Street, which was formerly known as the Lucy R. Morgan home, uh, was a recipient of some of those funds. But that, that uh, adds a little bit. And my, my uh, uncle, my, uh, my dad's bro youngest brother, had two brothers and an older sister. And Milton was named for Judge Scott. It was John, uh, John Milton Scott. So Milton Lundine got his first name from T Tilly's work at the Scott residence. And, uh, but that's a, it's, and I imagine she met Alfred at the Swedish church and he built a house for her and that was the end of her in servitude. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and it can be noted too that Julia Scott was eventually president, right, of the McLean County Coal Company. So overlap there in terms of um, that Stevensonville connection. Um, and uh, so, yeah, thank you for shining more light on that experience, Ed. 
Um, and I think uh, possibly in closing, again, to circle back to Sandra's comment, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's exactly what these programs are meant to challenge us to consider. Um, and so it's my hope that we did not undersell um, kind of the prejudice and the difficulty um, that our Swedish American community faced uh, moving into Bloomington, especially as strike breakers, right? I mean, there's this uh, connotation there alone, not to mention the cultural and language barriers, um, but to bring it back to that East-West uh, divide, you know, the, the history um, does not stop with the immigrant communities um, who were Swedish or Hungarian or Irish or German, right? The West Side today is largely populated um, by African American and Black identifying individuals, um, Mexican and Latinx folks and families. Um, and so, again, hopefully, as we move through this series, we're seeing those parallels, we're seeing that shared experience um, amongst our immigrant and migrant communities and challenging ourselves to consider what we take for granted today in terms of populations who have been, you know, able to assimilate again for better or for worse um, to their own kind of cultural identity or at loss of their own cultural identity. Um, yeah, at some point, every new group was new and every new group was othered um, and the Swedish Americans amongst them in Bloomington and in Chicago and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, nice response, Hannah. Thank you for that. Well, um, there, there was just a reminder that I think it's to everybody. Lingonberry jam is a favorite. <laughs> just back to circling back to what we share um, along the lines of food. And I, I remember um, hanging out in a kitchen in the Boston area with a friend of mine who came here from Norway as a very young girl, was so angry at her parents, she refused to speak English for the first few years, even though she could, because her father was American. Um, but I, I made pepenoter in their kitchen, those little round Christmas cookies. And it was so hard for them not to speak Norwegian in the kitchen, right? Because it was like the language of their, of their hearth. That's really the, that code switching that we talk about a lot in terms of the language we use and, and even how we communicate, not, not just the words, but the way. So yeah, this I, I, I have so enjoyed every single session of this episode of series and this episode was um, no different. It was just spectacular. All the information shared was great. So, um, but I wanna honor time. It's 2.31 and um, we promised to go to 2.30. Again, this, this will be available to anybody who wants to revisit it or share, share broadly, we encourage that. And um, you should be seeing it on our YouTube website in the next few days. Oh, right, and the next one, I just, I'm, I'm so interested in the conversation. Our very next one, okay, is Tuesday, June 8th at 6 p.m. Um, we are doing Kickapoo Food and Remedies with Lester Randall, the tribal chairman of the Kickapoo tribe in Kansas. Um, and just to give you another preview, um, July 10th, which is a Saturday, we're doing Soul Greens and Savory Things, local African-American food traditions with Willie Horton Halbert from the NAACP, author of Cooking with Love, and um, Jeff Woodard, who is our director of marketing at the McLean County Museum of History. So those are two that you can start uh, planning your future schedules around or making room for the uh, videotape production. Everyone have a great Saturday. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Gloria. And thank you, Candace, who is behind the scenes making all of this happen. <laughs>